In September 1997, Middle East Quarterly, a prestigious journal on Middle Eastern relations, published the article, Prince Charles of Arabia, where Ronnie L. Gordon and David M. Stillman wrote the following, Charles considers Christianity inadequate to the task of spiritual restoration, and denigrates science for having caused the West to lose its spiritual moorings. Echoing a common Muslim theme, he declares that Western civilization has become increasingly acquisitive and exploitive, in defiance of our environmental responsibilities. Instead, he praises the Islamic revival of the 1980s and portrays Islam as Britain's salvation. We must not be tempted to believe that extremism is in some way the hallmark and essence of the Muslim. Extremism is no more the monopoly of Islam than it is the monopoly of other religions, including Christianity. Gordon and Stillman continue in their article. Charles has traveled extensively in the Muslim world, with recent visits to Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, and Bangladesh. He has visited Turkey so often, that some observers believe that to be the country where his rumored, conversion to Islam took place. Some offices of the British government, have found a practical use for the prince's affection for Islam. In particular, the Foreign Office uses him as a point man for British business interests in Muslim countries, leading one journalist to comment that, the Charles of Arabia phenomenon is here to stay, for it helps assure British commerce with the Muslim world. Although some Britons may be bewildered, at Prince Charles's infatuation with Islam, he has become a hero among Muslims. John Casey of Cambridge University, warns that the British public lacks a clear understanding of Charles's standing in the Muslim world. The extent to which the prince is admired by Muslims, even to the point of hero worship, has not yet sunk into the consciousness of the British public. When it does, that public may, or may not be pleased. Casey concludes that the Prince of Wales's hero status in the Arab world is permanent. No other Western figure commands this sort of admiration. One of the characteristics of uh, British capitalism, the British economy, um, in recent times, really I suppose since the Second World War, it has been that the arms industry has played a very important role um, in the British economy and in British uh, trade. The British are very keen uh, to sell top-of-the-range weapons uh, technology. Uh, very often uh, the market is uh, dictators, uh, particularly dictators in the Middle East and North Africa. And if you want to establish diplomatic relations and trading relations uh, with feudal or semi-feudal uh, regimes in the Middle East and North Africa, it helps if you've got your own royals who can uh, operate at that social level, who can give you an entree. So Prince Charles has played a major role, Prince Andrew uh, has played a major role. Other royals, I'm sure as well, have played a role um, in developing these diplomatic relations and uh, helping arms manufacturers to sell weapons to Middle Eastern dictators. A royal biographer Robert Jobson writes in his book, Charles at 70, Thoughts, Hopes and Dreams. He is seen as a friend of some of the most powerful families on the planet. Among them are the Al Thanis of Qatar, the Husseins of Jordan, and the Al Saluds of Saudi Arabia, all of whom have known the prince personally for many years, and from whom he commands respect. Charles sees part of his role, whenever he visits the region, to make these rulers, so often ignored by superpower USA, feel how valued they are to Britain and how important that long-standing relationship is. Charles's Arab sympathies have led him to be accused of being anti-Jewish and anti-American. Later Jobson reveals how Charles thinks that the main cause for Islamic terrorism in the Middle East is in the influx of foreign, Eastern European Jews to Israel and in the Jewish lobby of the United States. He added that there would not be an end to terrorism unless those causes are eliminated. In reference to the Israel-Palestine conflict, he has often been heard to say, Remove the poison, and you remove the cause of so much of the terrorism. 
But if the cause for Islamic terrorism is, according to Charles, in the so-called Jewish lobby of the United States, and in the influx of Eastern European Jews to Israel, then he must think that the poison is Jews themselves. Those who seek to defame this great organization, APAC, those who seek to undermine American support for Israel, they must be confronted. Despite what they claim, they do not merely criticize the policies of Israel's government. God, I'm used to that. That happens every five minutes. They do something else. They spew venom that has long been directed at the Jewish people. Again, the Jews are cast as a force for evil. Again, the Jews are charged with disloyalty. Again, the Jews are said to have too much influence, too much power, too much money. Ladies and gentlemen, you know what the best way to respond to this kind of hatred is? We read it. We read it just a few days ago. In the book of Esther, when Mordechai confronted Haman of Persia, the best way to respond to those who spout this kind of hatred is not to bow down to them, it's to stand up to them. So I have a message to all the anti-Semites out there, whether they live in modern Persia, in the palaces of Tehran, or the bunkers of Beirut, whether they march through the streets of Charlottesville or murder worshippers in a synagogue in Pittsburgh, whether they voice their hatred in political parties in Britain or Europe or the United States. The Jewish people do not bow down. We stand up, we fight, and we win. My friends, ladies and gentlemen, some people will just never get it. They'll never understand why the vast majority of Americans, Jews and non-Jews alike, support Israel. Take it from this Benjamin, it's not about the Benjamins. The reason the people of America support Israel is not because they want our money. It's because they share our values. They just don't get it. It's because America and Israel share a love of freedom and democracy. It's because we cherish individual rights and the rule of law. It's because we don't judge people by the color of their skin, their religion, or their sexual orientation. I am proud of Israel's vibrant democracy, where no one, no one is a second-class citizen. All of Israel's citizens are first-class citizens. The left-wing British newspaper, The Guardian, told on the 19th of November 2003 that Prince of Wales has strong pro-Palestinian views and is privately critical of U.S. policy in the Middle East conflict. Although the past 20 years there may have been many reasons to be critical of the U.S. Middle East policy, According to this report, his pro-Palestinian sympathies are the predominant reason for his criticism, as sources close to Prince had revealed. They said that he is fairly Arabist. He has, in American terms and international terms, fairly dodgy views on Israel. He thinks American policy on the Middle East is complete madness, and he used to express that quite loudly to a lot of people, including ministers and various ambassadors. He doesn't much like American culture. And why he doesn't like the American culture? Because he thinks that Christianity has too much influence on American politics. Jobson writes how the prince finds the U.S. society, which in his view contains worryingly large element of born-again, evangelical, fundamentalist Christians, for whom the Old Testament seems more important than the New, and who take it literally, deeply worrying. This belief that evangelical and conservative Christians have too much political influence in Washington, D.C., is as common lament among the secular left as is the belief in the malevolent Jewish lobby among Muslims and far right. But wait a minute. If Charles is really worried about the separation of the church and state, then why his mother is the supreme governor of the Church of England? And receives the all, the world under Christ's dominion, and the ring of sapphire and ruby, Receive this orb, set under the cross, and remember that the whole world is subject to the power and empire of Christ our Redeemer. And why he is not worried about those Islamic absolute monarchies, where the religion is inseparable part of state, and where there is not a religious freedom at all. 
Saudi Arabia is a key U.S. ally in the Middle East and the world's largest oil exporter. Its state oil company is worth an estimated $10 trillion. The face of the new king, Salman, looms large over the streets. A single family, the House of Saud, has ruled the country since its founding. Saudi Arabia is an absolute monarchy ruled by the House of Saud since its inception in 1932. It is governed by a strict interpretation of Islamic Sharia law. Their fundamentalist Wahhabi interpretation of Islam, a Sunni Islamic movement that seeks to purify Islam of any innovations and practices that deviate from the 7th century teachings of the Prophet Muhammad and his companions, leads to rampant human rights violations across their entire society. Significantly, they are the only nation in existence in 1948 that has not embraced the principles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the most widely accepted human rights statement in history. The Saudi regime routinely takes part in capital punishment using such brutal methods such as beheadings and stonings. Saudi's religious police are empowered to execute individuals in public and do not hesitate to do so. The headless bodies of those who have been executed are often displayed publicly to serve as a reminder of government authority. Over 19 years ago, on September 11, 2001, 19 Islamic terrorists hijacked four passenger airliners and crashed three of them into the World Trade Center towers in New York City and into Pentagon in the deadliest single terrorist attack in human history. Fifteen of them were citizens of Saudi Arabia, and they all followed the same ultra-conservative fundamentalist Islam that the House of Saud has supported ideologically and financially in Saudi Arabia and around the globe over the decades. In 2016 declassified the 28 pages, the final section of the 2002 Congressional Report, into the intelligence activities before and after the September 11th attacks, conducted by the United States Senate and the House of Representatives, says that some of the September 11th hijackers were in contact with and received support or assistance from individuals who may be connected to the Saudi government. There is information, from FBI sources, that at least two of those individuals were alleged to be Saudi intelligence officers. According to this report, the committees are particularly concerned about the serious nature of allegations, contained in a CIA memorandum which discusses alleged financial connections between the September 11th hijackers, Saudi government officials, and members of the Saudi royal family. The report states how FBI files suggest, that a person named Al Bayoumi, provided substantial assistance to two of the hijackers after they arrived in San Diego in February 2000, and that same person may be a Saudi intelligence officer, who had extensive contact with Saudi government. He also received financial support from a Saudi company, affiliated with the Saudi Ministry of Defense. At the time, Saudi Defense Minister was Sultan bin Abdulaziz Al Saud, a member of the Saudi royal family. In an October 23, 2001 interview in Kuwaiti newspaper Asayasa, concerning 9-11 attacks, he said, Who stands behind this terrorism, and who carried out this complicated and carefully planned terrorist operation? Osama bin Laden and those with him, have said what indicates that they stand behind this carefully planned act. We, in turn, ask, are bin Laden and his supporters the only ones behind what happened? Or is there another power with advanced technical expertise that acted with them? You will be revolted and horrified to learn what prominent members of our government, including past presidents, have done. You will be equally amazed uh, and thrilled with the courage and determination of a few private citizens and former FBI agents who have beaten uh, the government uh, and uh, defeated the largest lobby effort in the world's history. Uh, to begin with 9-11, you know, as Dan said, uh, when all of you came in the room, if asked, well, what did Saudi Arabia have to do with 9-11? The first thing you'd say is 15 of the 19 hijackers were Saudi nationals. Some of you who pay particular attention to this might also uh, make uh, the comment that Dan made, and Saudi Arabia has been known uh, to give money to charities who in turn uh, funded Al-Qaeda. But the fact is, 
9-11 was an attack on the United States with the active uh, uh, intent uh, and cooperation from 11 known Saudi government officials. Saudi Arabian government officials were the accomplices without whom there never could have been a 9-11 attack. It is a common belief in the Arab and Muslim world that the 9-11 was a conspiracy against Muslims and that real perpetrators of those terrorist attacks were either the U.S. or Israeli government. Those kinds of conspiracy theories are prevalent also among some far-right and far-left groups who try to demonize the Western Judeo-Christian and capitalistic world and portray it as a source of all evils of the world. In fact, the most prominent promoter of those conspiracy theories has been the Saudi government itself to mislead the sincere seekers of truth and to incite the masses to accuse the Jews and all conservative Christians who's an ally President George W. Bush, a member of a cultic secret society Skull and Bones, was claimed to be. In November 2002, Ayn al-Yakim quoted the powerful Saudi interior minister, Prince Nayef, as saying, it is impossible that 19 youths carried out the operation of September 11, or that bin Laden or al-Qaeda did that alone. I think the Zionists are behind these events. The 28 pages says that the head of the central office is complicit in supporting terrorism, and it also raised questions about Prince Nayef. So yes, it was an outside job, not the Zionist one, but the Islamic one. And there was an effort to cover up the conspiracy, not by the Jewish lobby, but the Saudi Arabian lobby. And they have succeeded very well. Not just to cover up the Saudi Arabian role to the events of 9-11, but also to suppress all criticism on Islam in the Western world. Today, you cannot even point out the persecution of Christians, most persecuted religious group in the world, in the Muslim world, without being censored on social media, and charged for hate speech. They handed me over to the UK Kent police and an officer came into the room and handed me this information le leaflet which says Schedule 7 Terrorism Act and they told me that I'm now being detained under the Schedule 7 Terrorism Act, here's what I need to know. I do not have effectively any rights, at least for the first hour, I do not even have the right to remain silent. I was brought into a small questioning room, uh, one that you might see in the movies with the little tape uh, recorder on the table, and they began to question me on all manner of things, beginning with how would I describe myself politically? What is a nationalist? Uh, they moved on to, are you religious? How religious are you? Christian, how far Christian are you? Uh, yes, I am Christian. I am not a Christian extremist of any sort. And it got very strange when they moved on to the question after that, where they said, how do you feel about people running trucks into individuals to kill them, specifically Muslims? To which I, I nearly laughed, not because I think that's a funny matter at all, but to think that myself, a young Christian woman from Canada, uh, who has never been part of any terrorist organization, I've never endorsed any terrorist organization, I have no criminal record whatsoever, I'm sitting in a room with the Kent police being asked how I feel about running over Muslims with trucks. It was just absolutely absurd. Now, after that, uh, they asked me how I felt about right-wing terrorism, to which I once again told them, you can watch any of my social media, you can look at any of my videos online, not once have I endorsed terrorism, I think it is a horrific evil thing no matter who it comes from, the right, the left, Muslims, Christians, does not matter. And there was no point which they told me why I was detained under Schedule 7, whether they suspected me of terrorism, none of it. There was no reason given. After being detained for six hours, they gave me a form and it says here, you have asked for leave to enter the United Kingdom as a visitor for up to five days. However, by your own admission, on the 24th of February 2018, you were involved in the distribution of racist material in Luton. I believe that your actions whilst in the United Kingdom present a threat to the fundamental interests of society and to the public policy of the United Kingdom. 
The event that they are referring to is an event that I never at any point said or admitted to being racist material. It was a social experiment I was doing with a few people in Luton, referring to a Vice article claiming Jesus Christ may have been a gay man. We decided to do a spin-off and see how the public would react to other religions uh, being called gay or LGBT religions. So we came out with signs, pretended to be left-wing presenters, and said, Allah is a gay god. Allah is a god for gays and homosexuals as well. Uh, to which the police confiscated our material. I never violated any laws. I cooperated with them. And yet, I guess I get, got the end of my social experiment. I got the result. Vice is perfectly allowed to state Jesus Christ may be gay. If you say Allah may be gay, you get detained under Schedule 7 Terrorism Act and banned from the country for racism. What in that statement has to do with race, I cannot tell you. It seems more like the UK is bringing back ancient blasphemy laws. That's what this seems like. Blasphemy laws for those who offend Islam, but not for those who offend Christianity. While the United Kingdom is moving rapidly toward a new Saudi Arabia, Prince Charles is preparing to take the throne from his 94 years old mother, who may celebrate soon the 70th anniversary of her ascension to the throne. Heir to the throne, who suffers from some form of Christophobia, and who wants to use the Quran in his coronation oath, instead of the Bible. May obtain the crown of an everlasting kingdom by the gift of him whose kingdom endureth forever. In 1994, Prince Charles said in Jonathan Dimbleby's TV documentary, that as a king, he doesn't want to maintain an almost 500 years old tradition of his predecessors, to be known as a defender of the faith, meaning the Protestant Christian faith. Instead, he said that he would want to modernize this ancient title of the monarch, into the defender of faith, without the definite article, meaning all faiths of the world. I personally, you see, would much rather see it as defender of faith, not the faith, because it means just one particular interpretation of the faith, which I think is sometimes something that causes a great deal of problem, has done for hundreds of years. People have fought each other to the death over these things. It seems to me a peculiar waste of people's energy when we're all actually aiming for the same ultimate goal, I think. So I, mean, I, I would much rather it was seen as, as defending faith itself, which is so often under, under so much threat in our, in our day, where, you know, the, the whole concept of faith or belief in anything beyond this existence, beyond life itself, is, is considered but almost old-fashioned and irrelevant. So a, a defender of faith means defender of those who believe in a god in whatever form that you would want to encourage that um, that capacity and that urge yes jesus said i am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me although christianity teaches that jesus christ is the only way to salvation that does not mean that christians should not tolerate and live peaceably with the followers of other religions in fact the Bible urges us to honor all people, and as much as depends on you, to live peaceably with all men. But Christian faith also understands, that there is a spiritual war between Christ and his church, and the prince of this world. That's why Jesus said to his followers, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love its own. Yet, because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Christians should not seek conflict or hostility with anyone, but as long as we speak truth to this world, this world, will hate us. And this is the reason why Christians are still, almost 2,000 years after the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, the most hated, and persecuted group of people in the world. In fact, Prince Charles himself, has spoken in recent years on the Christian persecution in the Middle East, and called for the peace and coexistence for all three Abrahamic faiths. In December 2018, he spoke at Westminster Abbey, and said, I have been deeply humbled and profoundly moved, 
by the extraordinary grace and capacity for forgiveness that I have seen in those who have suffered so much. But as William Shakespeare said, even the devil can cite scripture for his purpose. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. But where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. Prince Charles definitely doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to God. In his book Harmony, he even suggests that the story of Jesus Christ in the four Gospels was a plagiarized myth from an older Osiris myth of ancient Egypt. The Apostle John said, Who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, who do not confess Jesus Christ, as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an Antichrist. Many students of Biblical eschatology, believe that the Antichrist will come forth from amongst Muslims, and fulfill the role of Islamic Mahdi, their end-time Messiah, who will subjugate the Jews, and the Crusaders of the West. However, Apostle John told that the Antichrist, and Antichrists, are those, who went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. Therefore, like Judas, the Antichrist must arise from amongst those, who are at least nominally the followers of Jesus Christ, i.e. Christians. Some teachers also say, that the Bible prophecy would indicate, that this last deceiver of the world will emerge from the Middle East, and not from Europe. They justify this with a few passages in the book of Isaiah, where this end-time tyrant, is called the king of Assyria. And likewise by the prophecies of the book of Daniel, which imply, according to some, that the Antichrist must arise from those lands, that Alexander the Great once ruled over. However, as a renowned Bible scholar, Robert Anderson, who was knighted by King Edward VII, in 1901, for his work at London Metropolitan Police, understood in his classic work, The Coming Prince, Chapter 8 of the Book of Daniel, does not actually imply the Antichrist's Middle Eastern, but his Greek origin. Although the discussion of the Antichrist's national origin, is a totally separate subject, where we won't go deeper into in this video. I should say that Prince Charles's own father, Prince Philip, was born in Greece in 1921, for the Greek royal family, and thus, Charles is the lawful claimant also to the crown of Greece, if its monarchy would be restored. And of course, the Antichrist's Greek origin refers more broadly, to his European and Western origin, as the ancient Greece was also the cradle of our Western civilization. Chapter 8 of the book of Daniel, actually confirms this in verse 9 where it says on his country of origin, and out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. Meaning that the glorious land, i.e. the land of Israel, is to the southeast from his country of origin. When it comes to the Antichrist nationality and position, there are also more specific prophecies, which points directly to the United Kingdom and its royal family, but as I said, we won't go deeper into these in this video. In regard to Isaiah's prophecies on the king of Assyria, and the king of Babylon, it is possible that those prophecies refer to Antichrist's final seat in the Middle East. Daniel 11.45 actually says, that after his wars of conquest, he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas, meaning the seas of the Middle East. But there are also valid biblical reasons, to believe in the Antichrist's connections to Islam, and their awaited Imam Mahdi. Although, to save time I won't mention them all, but one of them is Islam's general hatred, towards people of the book, a Quranic phrase for the Jews and Christians, whom the Quran calls worst of all creatures, and incite the Muslims to fight against them, until the day of resurrection. 
والمسلمون على دين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإمامهم المهدي من ذرية محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم فينزلون وهم في صلاة فيصلي خلفهم وإمامهم منهم ويدخل في شريعة محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ويقتل الخنزير ويحطم الصليب ويضع الجزية ويدخل النصارى كلهم في الإسلام من شاء الله له الهداية منهم وينقض المسلمون على اليهود فيقتلونهم ولا يبقون منهم نفسا حتى أن الحجر والشجر يقول يا مسلم هذا يهودي خلفي تعال فاقتله اللهم عجل هلاكهم اللهم احصهم عددا واقتلهم بددا ولا تذر منهم أحدا Daniel 8:24 says on the Antichrist, His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully, and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty, and also the holy people. This speaks of the Jews and Christians. As we have seen, Prince Charles doesn't just glorify Islam, but he also fraternizes with those Gulf rulers, who have sponsored radical Islam for decades. As Julian Assange's WikiLeaks brought to light from Hillary Clinton's emails, governments of Qatar and Saudi Arabia provided clandestine financial and logistic support to ISIL that crucified Christians and burned them alive. As Burke's Peerage confirms, Prince Charles is descended from the Prophet Muhammad via his daughter Fatima, and thus he is the rightful claimant for the role of Imam Mahdi, who according to Islamic eschatology, will break the cross Allah sallata alayhim tuwal at-tarikh man yu'addibuhum natilata ifsadihim akhir ta'dib kan ta'dib Hitler ma fa'ala bihim un kan mubalagu fil amr ma balagu walakin istata'a an yani yuqifahum inda hududihim wa kan hada adaban ilahiyan تأديبا إلهيا وعقابا عقابا قدريا لهؤلاء والمرة القادمة إن شاء الله ستكون على أيدي المؤمنين